Welcome to today's webinar on dispersed CDBG funds at risk of cancellation 2017 grants. Uh, note, as I mentioned, uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, that would include all chat messages and Q&A. So if you're typing anything in to the chat or Q&A, um, it will be saved. So we'll have a copy of that. Um, including the recording and the recording, recording will be made available to you and along with the transcript um, shortly after this webinar, more, more on that later. I know folks are still joining. Do want to mention that uh, this webinar is made possible with funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Office of Community Planning and Development. And again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you're a regular attender, glad to have you back. If you're first time, I hope you'll find today's session to be helpful. Uh, my name is Rob Sronz. I'm with the Cloudburst Group, today's host for this webinar. Uh, I have with me today my colleagues from the Cloudburst Group, John Coons. Hey, John. Hey, Rob. Hello, everybody. And Susan Walsh. Hi, Susan. Hi, welcome, everyone. I'd also like to acknowledge our colleagues behind the scene, uh, scenes, <laughs> Lindsay Gillette and TJ Winfield. We also have joining us from HUD's Office of Block Grant Assistance today, Pu Peng Wang and Aaron Martin. They will be available for Q&A at the end of the hour. Uh, before I, before we start, um, I'll review a few housekeeping items. Our session is scheduled for one hour. The host has muted all attendees. Uh, video and screen sharing has been disabled. For the best experience, we encourage you to close email messaging and other applications that may be taking a bandwidth or serving as a distraction. Webinar materials will be posted in about two weeks from today as we finalize and review the transcript and recording, we hope to get the slide deck on the training page out uh, sooner than that. So you may see that pop up on the training page um, sooner than we can get out the transcript and the, um, the recording. There's a lot of material to cover today, but we do hope to have some time for a live Q&A at the end of the hour. I uh, did want to note, and I see some already, if you have technical questions about the webinar, um, having issues, please do um, chat at the uh, at the host. Uh, they'll be able to help you with that, we hope, um, be able to resolve that. Uh, we'll also be watching that chat as presenters are speaking. If you have a question that you would like us to answer about the content of this session, please use the Q&A feature of WebEx. We'll be watching that Q&A. Uh, if we can answer them uh, as they come up, we'll do that uh, in the background. Uh, we'll also, we hope, have some time after to answer those questions. Um, if for some reason you cannot see the Q&A panel, uh, you may need to go down um, in the frame of the WebEx app there at the bottom right-hand corner. There are three dots. If you click on that, you'll be able to see the various um, uh, the modules that you can select. You may need to actually select Q&A to get that to show. If we don't get to your question today, or if you need help at all with expending your expiring CDBG funds, we are offering office hours on four dates. June 17th and 18th, and July 9th and 10th. Office hours, you'll be able to meet with a TA, individual TA provider to go through your individual situation and help you resolve any problems you have encountered or any unanswered questions you have about expiring funds, accessing them, finding them, using them. Uh, I'll drop a link in the chat, chat in just a minute here. Uh, we'll also provide it at the end. Um, also, the, there'll be, uh, it's already gone out or will go out, um, a HUD news item letting you know, uh, reminding you of office hours uh, being available and how to sign up. And with that, I will pass it along to our first presenter, John. 
And, and all right, John. thank you, Rob. And thanks again for everybody okay. for joining us. Uh, so our fundamental objective today is to share information to help make sure your grantee does not lose any of your remaining 2017 grant fund years due to expire on uh, September 27th, which is just about uh, three months away. So for today's three and a half months, actually. Uh, for today's session, Susan and I hope you come away with a better understanding in two key areas. So first, how to find, release, and reallocate 2017 grant funds. And then second, how to take the steps needed to draw all your 2017 grant funds by the September 27th, 2024 deadline. All right, agenda. We'll start with a brief overview and then look at how to determine your 2017 grants, uh, commitments and grant balances. We'll look at how to find unexpended 2017 CDBG funds. Uh, so this may be quick task for some of you, but it may be also more involved if funds are still associated with activity two, uh, which is a special activity that we'll talk about in this, today's session. We'll wrap up some of the specifics and considerations for obligating and drawing down the 2017 grant funds before the deadline. So a little bit of an overview. First of all, who should be here? Who should attend? Uh, really, we wanna make sure you really wanna be here for the next uh, 50 plus minutes with us. This webinar was di designed specifically for uh, entitlement and state grantees with unexpended 2017 CDBG grant funds. The webinar may also be helpful to CDBG grantees who have drawn all of your 2017 grant, but have uh, concerns about 2018 rather or later grant balances. And even with that, uh, the session will also cover some general practices for finding grant funds, committed to activities, and a few other tidbits of IDS knowledge if you're interested. Others, uh, you know, if you think you're not here, we won't be hurt too badly if you do leave, but we do hope most of you stay. Why do 2017 grant funds matter now? They matter because the uh, National Defense Authorization Act of, 20, of 1991, uh, under that act, all CDBG grant accounts will cancel at the end of the eighth federal fiscal year. So at that point, the US Treasury will recapture any undisclosed, undisturbed rather, undispersed 2017 CDBG grant funds at the end of, that, of this federal year in September. Any 2017 grant funds not dispersed by that 20, September 27th deadline will automatically return to Treasury. And just to be very specific, you have until the 27th at the latest to approve any draws. However, we would also humbly suggest that you uh, build in a few days leeway to avoid unanticipated interruptions. On very rare occasions, there may also be an issue with locks processing a payment overnight. So for 2024, September 27th happens to fall on a Friday. And so you may want to aim for no later than Wednesday, September 25th to approve any final draws. Otherwise, there's just this chance these precious federal funds uh, that could be supporting your community uh, may be instantly lost with no recourse from HUD. Although most of you have probably completed all of your 2017 action plan activities, you may still have some 2017 grant funds available. And there's a couple reasons for this. Even if you had once committed all of your 2017 grant funds to activities, some of them may have come in under budget or have been canceled as, as happens uh, in the CDBG world, 
or if you had program income at hand when you needed to draw against 2017 activity, uh, you may have correctly used program income funds instead of the 2017 grant that originally funded the activity. Uh, in, in that case, using these PI funds, program income funds, uh, would release the entitlement funds for use uh, for other activities. And remember, IDS will release any remaining balances when an activity is completed to the line of credit. Tracking and reallocating entitlement funds during the program year or part of each annual action plan will help ensure old grant, grant funds are used. Even with that, uh, 2017 grant funds could also remain somewhat hidden um, when a grantee repays HUD for ineligible costs but does not take some of the necessary steps to reallocate these funds on another activity. I know Susan's going to cover these cases a little bit when we talk about activity two. All right, now we're going to um, focus the rest of the presentation. Uh, we're going to go over four primary steps grantees can take to avoid losing at-risk 2017 grant funds. Step one is to confirm the status of your grant balance. This step two is to find out precisely where those unexpended funds are tucked away. And step three, steps three and four are to commit the 2017 funds and then spend them by the deadline. And these last two steps may involve developing a spending plan and reallocating 2017 funds to faster moving activities. So now I'm going to hand the um, the wand over to Susan to start us down step one. Hi, okay, thanks, John. So hi, everyone. Um, so let's talk about how you can determine your 2017 CDBG grant balance. And we're also gonna talk about not just the money to draw, but amount to commit to be able to fund an activity. So, um, you know, just different ways of seeing the grant and seeing where your money is. So there's a couple ways to be able to see your grant balance. And one is to search directly in IDIS and the other is to look at a report. So we'll talk about both of those ways. Um, so if you wanna look at your grant in IDIS, the simple thing is just to go to your grant tab at the top and search for your grant. You can just use the little drop down under program to select CDBG. And if you want to just look at your 17 grant, just select under year 17. If you just leave that blank, then you'll see all your years and you can always look at 17 or any other year. And then just click search. Then you're going to see on the screen the some of the information about your grant. Um, your grant uh, number is on there and the current authorized amount, uh, the status of the grant, the net drawn amount and the grant balance, which is the undrawn amount. You don't see anything about commitments on this screen, but you can then select view, which is gonna give you some more information uh, when you see the actual view grant screen. Now this um, slide that you see is actually a little bit different than what you see in IDIS because the information that you see on the left is gonna be at the top of your screen and then the information you see on the right will be at the bottom. So it's kind of a one long screen that you might need to scroll down. Um, so the information you see here on the left is just some general information about your grant. And then the information on the right is what you'll see when you scroll down. And there's actually a little bit more in the screen than what we show here. This is just what we're uh, showing that's pertaining to what we're interested in today. So you'll see here that you have the, your original allocation amount and your current authorized amount. Those are usually the same. Sometimes they're slightly different if there was an adjustment made to the grant, but most of the time they'll be the same. And then you'll see your net drawn amount and you further down, you'll see amount committed to activities, uh, amount available to commit to activities and amount available to draw. And these are all important uh, figures, important information that you need. Um, and we're gonna get into each of these a little bit uh, more um, as well. But the other way to see your grant balance is 
Uh, there's a report that's really good for that for CDBG, and that's the PR01, HUD Grants and Program Income Report. Probably most of you know about this report because it's pretty much a standard report that everybody likes to use. And it's, it's really nice because it shows all this information in a report format. It will show all your grants, but you can just look and see what the status is of your 17 grant. Um, and a couple things uh, just to remind you that when you run a report in MicroStrategy, it's always going to be uh, information from what you changed in IDIS the day before. So if you funded some activities uh, today, you're not going to see that change in the amount available to commit because you've used some of that money. So you won't see that till the next day. And if you just did some draws, you're going to need to, um, you know, approve those draws and have them completed. Um, so uh, you want to just make sure that if you run the report that you haven't made any changes just the day before. Um, the other thing I want to mention about this report is that it, uh, if you happen to use sub funds, now I know not everybody does use sub funds for CDBG, they're voluntary, but there is an AD sub fund you can choose to use for your administration money and then you can use SU sub fund, not very many folks use that for sub recipients. But if you happen to use either AD or SU or both, then keep that in mind that those funds will not necessarily display correctly on this report for the available to commit and available to draw because of the sub fund feature doesn't translate into the report very well. So if you happen to be one of those grantees that does use the AD sub fund, for example, uh, just check that separately. Um, it will show on the report, but it may not be accurate. Um, but otherwise, for most of you that don't use those, um, everything you can see on that report will be accurate and it's helpful to see in a report format. So another way, just let's take a look at this, looking at a graphic. Um, you wanna know how much 2017 grant money do we need to spend? Um, so just looking at an example, this is a grantee that has a, a current authorized amount of 1.4 million. Um, then the green section is the net drawn amount. And uh, then you have the blue section amount available to draw. And if you take the net drawn amount, the amount you've already drawn, plus the amount available to draw, then that's gonna be equal to your current authorized amount. So how much money do we have to spend? Uh, take that, the difference between those two, and that's $200,000. So, you know, subtracting the 1.2 million from the 1.4 million. So amount available to draw is $200,000. But then we also need to look at how much do we have available to commit? So let's take a look at that. And so now we're gonna use that example again of the 1.4 million. And in the blue bar, we can see amount committed to activities. And in the orange bar, we can see amount available to commit to activities. And those two amounts also are gonna equal your current authorized amount. The amount that's already been committed to activities and then the amount available to commit to activities. So how much 2017 CDBG grant monies do we have to, to commit to activities that we need to commit to activities? So the difference between these two is the current authorized amount is the 1.4 million, the amount committed is 1,220,000. So the amount available to commit to activities is 180,000 in this example. So now the next step is how much of this money then do we have committed to activities but not drawn? Because we have, you know, the amount that was available to commit of 180,000, we had the amount available to draw of 200,000, but then there's a difference there, right? And so if we look at that difference, that's $20,000. So that's money that's been committed to activities, but not yet drawn. And so that means that's not money we have available, it's already funded in activities, but we need to pay attention to that because we need to be able to say, uh, you know, is that really money going to be spent? And if it isn't, we need to move it. So now I'm going to pass it back over to John to talk about that next part of that process. Thanks, Susan. All right, on to step number two of finding any unexpended 2017 grant funds. 
grantees will find their uh, unexpended 2017 grant funds is in one of these three categories. The first category are funds that are not committed to any activity, which Susan just talked about. Uh, these funds are in plain sight and readily available to commit to faster moving activities uh, that will disperse them this summer. The second category are those funds that are committed to activities, but not yet drawn. And we'll show you how to find these in a moment. The key point here is that you want to evaluate each of these 2017 funding activities to see if they will expend the money by the September 27th deadline. If you can draw the money obligated to that activity by the deadline, then no action is needed. You're good to go. But if the 2017 funds are obligated to slower moving activities, you may need to move them to faster moving activities in need of a draw by the deadline. And just to note, if, if you do move the 2017 funds, then you will likely need to replace them with newer grant funds. And also just think, you know, you want to be a little careful, you know, when you're thinking about this kind of kicks down kicks the can down the road, um, which is important sometimes because it will make sure you don't lose the funds, but you just want to think about how switching funds will be addressed uh, in the following years. Last but not least, the uh, third category are unresolved vouchers associated with activity number two. Susan will go over these in more details in a few minutes. But in the meantime, uh, we'll return to the second category and talk about some tools to find these unexpended 2017 grant funds that are obligated to activities. So how do you find the open activities funded with your 2017 CDBG grant? One option is always to go to activity funding screen uh, in IDIS and search for open activities. You would then have to look at each one of these um, to see if there's undrawn 2017 grant funds. And this may work for some of your uh, the smaller grantees, uh, you know, with not too many activities, but it would be very time consuming and kind of painful for others. So there's an easier way. Uh, one way is to use one of my go-to reports, the PR26 CDBG Activity Summary by Selected Grant Report. This is the report that grantees need to submit with their CAPER to demonstrate that they have not exceeded the planning and admin caps for the grant origin, origin year test. However, it's also an invaluable tool uh, for finding activities, finding exactly where activities have been funded by specific grant year and whether these funds have been drawn or not. This PEER 26 report lists every activity by specific grant year. It's organized, it organizes your activities by the grant year funding uh, of the activity rather than the action plan year, which is, as some of you may be used to, and you use the PRO2 or PRO3 reports and many other reports uh, that may be more common for you to use. This PR26 report groups activities first by grant year and then by activity category, which are based in the matrix codes. And you can run this for a single year, a single grant year, or multiple years. You can find the report, the CDBG Activity Summary by Selected Grant Year Report in the PR26 PR folder in MicroStrategy, which includes all three versions of the uh, PR26 report. Once you select the um, the report, the, the PR26 CDBG activity summary by selected grant year, then you just need to 
select at least one grant year, uh, but you can also do more than one. In this case, since we're only interested in the 2017 grant year, we could, uh, we will just select that one. All right, take a look at the image. It's just a small part of the report that shows you how to find committed but undrawn grant funds by activity, uh, but it's in the same structure. The middle columns just to the right of the activity status gives you the amount, gives the amount funded and the amount drawn from the selected grant year, which in this case, since we ran it for 2017 would be 2017. You can see that the, you can, if you look carefully, you can see that activity 14181 is open and it's funded with $46,755 from the 2017 grant. You can also see there have been no draws made against the 2017 entitlement grant for this activity. So this shows us where that $46,755,000 are. Uh, they're, they're tucked away in this activity. So now you just need to determine if you can draw these 2017 funds on this current activity or if you need to move them to a faster moving activity. Let's move to the third and final category of the unexpended funds, the unresolved vouchers associated with activity two. So for most of you, adding up the amounts already available for funding and those that are committed to an activity but undrawn uh, should match the remaining 2017 balances. So what we've done so far. However, in some cases, they may not. Uh, and this will usually because they are locked in these unresolved vouchers associated with activity two. And we'll show you how to check activity two and how to release these funds to be committed to other activities. First though, just a little background on activity two. Um, so just what is activity two and why it's open and just sitting there in IDS for each of you. Activity two is a, a special activity originally set up to migrate the historical CDBG financial transactions uh, when IDS was born, which was almost 20 years ago, I believe. And you'll notice um, there's an activity one, two, one, three, and four, and those activities serve the same purpose for the other CPD entitlement programs, which some of you have and some of you don't. Activity two still serves other role, roles, however. So for example, a grantee may need to return funds for either overdrawn or ineligible CDBG activities. So in these cases, HUD would enter a credit against activity two after receiving your payment. And that voucher will show up as a negative amount associated with activity two. In addition, if your grantee just happens to have a Section 108 loan and has missed a debt service payment, HUD will take funds from your line of credit in locks. They'll do it automatically. Uh, however, they will then enter a voucher in Activity 2 to reflect the funds taken for the Section 108 debt payment. And these vouchers show a positive amount. amount. Uh, now, I'm going to pass it over to Susan, back to Susan, to talk about these credits and debits associated with Activity 2. Okay, thanks, John. So um, let's talk about Activity 2 and how to see it in IDIS. And actually, this is important, I think, for everyone, even if you don't have any 2017 funds uh, in that activity, there may be other year's funds that need to be um, handled in there. So it's always a good idea to take a look. Um, there may have been a change of staff and you're not really aware of some returned funds, something like that. So it is a good idea to take a look at this from time to time. And so you can just go simply to activity funding and search for activity number two and, uh, and then just click view. 
So one thing that really is important is to see is activity to balanced between the drawn amount and the funded amount. And again, this activity is not something that you can edit the funding. Uh, you can't change anything on the activity setup. It's just this special activity that's in there. But your drawn amount and funded amount, if they're equal, that means everything balances. And if there were any returned funds or missed section 108 payments or anything like that, they will uh, have been taken care of and everything will be balanced. So take a look, see if there's a negative or a positive balance in activity two. And if there is, then you need to take the next step, which is to look at those vouchers. So how do you see vouchers in activity number two? Well, this is uh, how you can see vouchers in any activity uh, is you simply go to the funding drawdown tab at your um, on IDIS and then on the left hand side, go to drawdown search voucher and you can search for vouchers uh, just by an activity number. If you just want to see activities, uh, all the vouchers from a particular activity number, then you can click, you can search by the activity number. So just enter two. And the other thing is the earliest creation date is automatically filled in for you. Um, and it changes every year, but I think right now it's January 1st of 18. Uh, you may want to just blank that out so you can see all of the vouchers just to get a look at it and, um, and see if there's anything uh, possibly that came in in 17 that you would want to see, but probably any 17 grant year vouchers would be uh, after January 1st of 18, but you can take that out just to be sure. And then you go ahead and click search. So here's a picture of what you might see and I uh, just want to show you kind of some different examples. Um, so you can see here that there's, um, you know, information about the voucher number, the creation date, uh, the grant number, which tells you what year the money is from. The uh, activity name, of course, is, is the committed funds adjustment or whatever, but the line status, that's important and, and the amount uh, here is very important. And so completed vouchers are vouchers that um, you may need to do something about, but if there's one that says revise, then you don't have to worry about that. We'll go to the next slide and just take a look at each one of these. So, um, there may be a credit, like John said, if you returned funds to HUD uh, to the line of credit, then it's going to show up as a credit or a negative voucher. Think about when you create a voucher, it's a positive amount and it's being taken out of your line of credit, out of your LOX account. When you return money, it goes back to your LOX account. And so it's a credit. And so in IDIS, that shows up as a negative voucher. Um, and so this is an example where you have. A voucher it has a net brackets around it indicating it's a negative amount for 81,406,81. ,000, and you can see the grant number is B17. That tells you that's from the 17 year. Uh, and it's completed status, which means it has not been dealt with yet. So most likely you're going to have to do something about this voucher um, in order to free up that money and make it available to you. So again, kind of, you know, what John was saying, return funds uh, could be overdrawn activities. Maybe you drew some money uh, and really didn't need that money. So you had to send it back to your line of credit because you had it too soon. Uh, maybe you had spent some money and it was ineligible activities or ineligible costs for an activity and you had to send that money back to your line of credit. Um, and again, these are negative amounts and they normally show up as completed CO. CO actually stands for collection like a collection of funds um, and taking care of these vouchers by moving them to the right place uh, frees up your money to commit to other activities because until you do that, your, your available commit is not going to be, you're not going to be able to see those available to commit funds. So that's why it's important to be able to take care of these vouchers in activity two. Now, when you do this search, you may see some from other years and that's important to take care of as well. Uh, but we're going to focus on 17 because that's, of course, the year that's expiring. But you'll want to make sure you address other vouchers from other years that newer years, because that's going to help you see the money you have available in those other years. If it's anything from a past year, then you don't have to worry about it. 
So just quickly to tell you um, what the step is, is that you have to revise those CO or collection vouchers to the activity that originally drew down the money. Because when you sent that money back to your line of credit, that was because you spent money from an activity that was either ineligible or overdrawn. And so now you want to put that money back to undraw the money, right? To, to, to show it as back as not drawn. And so that's what happens when you revise that voucher. It, it puts that money, it takes it out of the drawn amount and puts it back into the funded amount. Um, so you need to make sure though that the activity that you're revising it to has drawn funds from that same year and that same fund type. So, um, you know, you can't have an activity that maybe you drew 18 money and you're trying to revise a voucher back this for 17 money because it won't work. When you try to do it, it's not gonna let you do it. Um, so hopefully when you return the money, you indicated the year properly and it's all gonna match up. Um, and the other thing to remember too, is that the activity revising that voucher too has to be an open status. So it may be completed if it's an older activity, you'll just need to go and reopen it temporarily till you take care of everything and then you'll be able to recomplete it. Now, we get a question a lot where uh, perhaps, you know, you're new, everybody's new, and something was returned years ago, and you don't know what that return was for. So how do you know what activity to apply it to? So we have some suggestions. Uh, monitoring reports are really helpful. If HUD did a monitoring, that's oftentimes when they might find uh, an issue where you spent some funds ineligible, you know, on an ineligible activity or ineligible costs of an activity or maybe you exceeded a, an admin cap or public service cap and you had to send funds back. So these monitoring reports can be very helpful to see and um, audit reports, maybe your single audit that you have once a year or in some kind of internal audit. Um, and HUD correspondence, of course, would be very helpful because anytime you send money back to your line of credit, you should be contacting your HUD office, your field office, so you may have emails or paperwork between the office. So those will all be uh, helpful to see uh, what activity was this meant for? Because the the funds, when the funds are wired, they aren't they don't necessarily indicate the the activity number. They just indicate the year. And also MicroStrategy Report PRO7, which is a list of all vouchers. You could run that for all of your if you're looking for 17 for all your 17 grant year vouchers. You could fil filter it for 2017 and perhaps you might see a draw that was matches exactly what you returned and that would tell you, oh, that's probably why you sent it back. But that's not always um, the case because sometimes it's several draws that you had to send back together all in one lump sum. So um, just, but just some ideas of possibly being able to find that information. Um, if you don't, if you've done all your due diligence and you still can't find out what activity, then you can, revise it to the uh, to your admin activity that drew 17 money or whatever that year is of that voucher. Um, and that's always a possibility. But again, you know, you can always um, individual situations, you can ask for office hours or you can ask for uh, IDIS ask a question and we can help you with that. So when you do revise uh, that voucher, then what happens is it undraws the money and then you need to release that those funds from that activity funding so that it's available to you somewhere else. And then you'll be able to, so you can go in and edit the funding to reduce it, or you can complete the activity. And when you complete activities, that releases the funds back to your available balance. And then now you're gonna have that those, those funds showing as available, whereas before you, it looked like it was available, but you didn't really have it. It's not available in your in your funding screen. So now you'll be able to see it. And there is a really helpful memo um, that methods for returning community development block grant funds um, that explains all the steps and it really starts with returning money and then what you need to do after the money's returned. It has several different scenarios in this memo. Um, so we're, we're really just talking about the first scenario of returning it back to your line of credit. Um, and then after you re revise the voucher, it's gonna show as revised. And so now it's just an historical record. And then the other thing that John had also mentioned was that, <clears throat> excuse me, that there may be some debits 
because HUD took money from your line of credit for a missed section 108 repayment. And so literally HUD creates a voucher, puts it into activity two, takes that money from your line of credit, but that voucher is just sitting there in activity two and it's not funded anywhere in any activity. So it, it, it kind of messes up your, your available to commit balance and doesn't really give you a true picture until you take care of that voucher. So if this happens to apply to you, you'll need to um, take some special steps. Um, and again, it's going to be a positive amount and it's going to display as completed MP. Sometimes it's AD for adjustment or MP as manual payment. Um, but that's normally what you'll see. That means it's probably a missed uh, section 108 payment. And so what we want you to do in that case is talk to the section 108 office first. Now, if they balance each other out, uh, so you see a negative and a positive for the same year and the same amount, then you don't have to do anything because they balance each other out. And that does happen sometimes. Maybe you made your payment, but it was a few days late. And so HUD had taken it out of your line of credit, but then you sent the money in a few days later, then they can take, uh, you know, they can put that credit in there and now balance it out. So nothing has to be done. But sometimes if it's just one payment that isn't balanced out, and your balance of your, you know, is off, then you do have to take care of it. However, IDIS users cannot revise those vouchers themselves. The programmers have to do it for you. And so if that's uh, applicable to you and you've done your research and realize you do need that voucher move, then send it and ask a question and we can talk to you about that and get that taken care of. But again, it's very important if they don't balance each other out to make sure that you, um, you know, take care of it at some point and don't wait to the last minute on these. So if there is a balance in activity two, another way to see it is in a report. Um, the PRO5 is a really good report for uh, if you're just looking at uh, vouchers in a one activity because it's easy to run it and just specify one activity that you want and then it will show you all the vouchers for that activity. So PRO5 is really the easiest. You can also run a PRO7 and maybe filter it you know, for, for particular activity or particular years or whatever, but, um, you know, you could filter it for activity too, but PRO5 is probably a little bit easier. And uh, again, um, it's important to resolve these vouchers in activity two, if need be, if it applies to you, because it does affect your amount available to commit, amount available to draw, um, because you may see money is available to commit, but you don't see it, you can't find it anywhere. It's like, it's not, not showing up in the system under your available funding, but it's showing as available to commit, or maybe, you know, it's, it's showing that you have available to commit uh, or not available to commit, but you really do. I mean, these things can just be really um, not making sense because of these vouchers. And so once you resolve those vouchers, everything should line up and, and work for you. So I'm gonna turn it over to John now so he can continue to help you um, with the next step. Thanks, Susan. All right, so now we'll back out just a little bit and we're going to talk about how to make sure all of your 2017 grant funds are committed to the right activities so that you can draw them down by the September grant expiration date. The steps we've talked about may uh, show that all of your 2017 grant funds are obligated to faster moving activities that you're confident you can draw by the summer. And if so, you may just need to monitor these activities and you can rest easily um, as you'll keep all of your 2017 grant funds. However, there's some cases where more planning may be needed. Uh, particularly for grantees with bigger balances. And uh, so developing a spending plan to guide and communicate steps needed to disperse the 2017 grant may be helpful, just getting a little more involved. And, and the grant, the plan could be quite basic or it may be more involved if you need to accelerate program activities and work with payment schedules and so forth. Don't forget to uh, 
factor in the potential need for an annual action plan amendment to carry out your spending plan. And we'll touch on that in a few minutes. So now let's look a little closer at some of the options you can consider for spending your 2017 grant. The first option is to identify and then obligate your 2017 funds to activities that will draw down funds by the deadline. So these faster moving activities may already be funded by other grant years. So that's something that would be quite common probably. In these cases, you will need to uh, reduce the funding from the later grant year and then commit the 2017 funds. And you may swap the 2017 grant funds with the newer grant funds, uh, and we'll touch on a few caveats later. And so where do you do this? You can do it at the bottom half of the activity funding screen. So in this example, we can see the activity was funded with 2021 grant and um, you know, you also know that it needs to be drawn before the September uh, 27th deadline. So if you are confident it would spend these $20,000 this summer, say, say at least $20,000 this summer, then you could just add $20,000 in the 2017 line. Uh, you can see the, the blowout of that. Um, and then you would reduce the 2021 funded amount by the same $20,000. So that would go down to 305,000. A grantee with outstanding section 108 loan guarantee balances does have a second option. Uh, so you may consider paying down some of your section 108 balances with your 2017 grant. Is this is of interest to you? Contact the Section 108 office using the email on the screen uh, as soon as possible. Uh, you know, they, they will work with you, um, but just remember it does take some time. And if you're unsure, you could consult with your, your field office. I do know that um, OBGA, the Office of Block Grant Assistance, does send out to each field office monthly updates of activities that uh, still have balances of 2017 funds. And there's also uh, something they share that shows of those who might have a balance they could use, they could pay off uh, with their 2017 funds, a balance of uh, Section 108 funds. So, you know, that's probably not your first go to, but it could be a, an important way to do it. There are other actions that grantees, especially those with large balances, may also consider if you don't see your current trajectory is spending the, enough of the 2017 grant funds by September 27th. It's a more proactive approach and it does, we do borrow some techniques from that are often used to accelerate expenditures generally um, when you're trying to meet a CDBG timeless standard, which uh, Every grantee has to, to deal with, uh, I think, 60 days before the, uh, the end of their program year. And you can find great resources on CDBG Timeless on the HUD exchange that can give a lot more details there. You may need to look more broadly at activities that may benefit from increased funding this summer. Uh, so do you have some activities with high demand for services that you can increase their funding and, and delivery schedule? You can reach out to your partner agencies and to your sub recipients with existing programs to encourage them to accelerate their programs and even see if they could benefit from more funding. And then states and urban counties can do the same thing. They can reach out to their local, uh, their local units of government. You may be able to accelerate some payment schedules for infrastructure or other projects. So just for example, you can make an interim payment on a large infrastructure project rather than waiting till the end. Um, and of course you wanna make sure that any work you pay for is actually completed and they've met all your CDBG and local requirements. And it may be getting a little late for this, but 
you know, perhaps for some of you, there is a new project ready to go. Uh, you just want to be careful, of course, about cutting corners, especially completing the environmental review. And finally, don't forget planning and admin activities where grantees have steady costs um, and potentially could be accelerated. Uh, so you can uh, sometimes make sure you're using your 2017 funds there. Uh, but I do need to add one big caution there. And so the big caution is to make sure you remain in compliance with both the planning and admin cap tests. And then uh, just to remind my folks, states uh, have their own planning and admin tests that use the PR, and they use the PR 28 report. Uh, and states may want to reference notice CPD 2111 for guidance. And actually, uh, let me go back here. I just want to touch, I'll just touch on these two PR26 reports. So the program year test, which the PR26 CDBG financial summary report evaluates, looks at the overall obligations, expenditures on planning and admin activities during the program year. So this, this cap does not consider the source year of the funding uh, for the admin activities and it can also be increased if you receive program income. But we want to pay special attention to the second planning and admin cap where grantees cannot spend more than 20% of each entitlement grant on planning and admin activity. So the source of your planning and activity cap for your 2017 grant is, 20, is just 20% of your 2017 entitlement grant, and it's not affected by any program income received. So you could use the same PR26 activity summary by selected grant report we talked about earlier to evaluate the, uh, the spending cap. And then don't forget uh, with the guides available that we, we share a little bit later as well, um, there's great information on this, real detailed, and then I'll also never forget to consult with your uh, field office if you have questions. Although not the driving force, uh, consider one other thing. These, these new grant closeout requirements HUD is implementing for CDBG. Uh, you want to think about that when you're moving your 2017 grant money. So one of the requirements is that a grant cannot be closed out until all activities are completed. So if possible, avoid putting your 2017 grant funds into an activity that will not be completed for years. Uh, an example, let's say you're using your 2017 grant funds for acquisition of a property for an affordable housing development that will be funded with home or other sources. Uh, and these can take some time and can encounter delays. So you can reference, uh, you can look up CPD notice 22-14 for more information on grant closeouts. I know that I believe, you know, HUD is still working out some of the details of this relatively new process and is probably gonna be in touch with you about these as well. So there are two final reminders as we're just about to come to a close of our presentation. The first, um, first communicate soon with stakeholders is critical. Uh, we suggest that program and finance staff meet to agree on a spending plan and just to make sure that the 2017 funds are committed and drawn according to the plan. You may want to contact your subrecipients or units of local governments to ensure they submit their invoices early and to make sure you have sufficient time to review and draw the phones before the deadline. Also, do confirm if your plan, your, your spending plan will require an action plan amendment, especially if your citizen participation plan shows 
that the changes trigger the substantial amendment. It's possible that swapping the funds, we talked about that earlier, among the grant years and reallocating funds elsewhere uh, would require an amendment, which you just want to make sure you build into your timeline. You, you are encouraged to talk with your CPD rep for any guidance on the action plan requirements and in any additional policy questions. Okay, that was a lot of information in a short time. Um, so Rob is going to share some resources and opportunities for direct technical assistance. And hopefully time will permit us to answer some questions too. Rob? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, John. And yeah, we're, we're running right up against the, uh, against the hour. Uh, so I dropped some links into the chat. Um, we'll also have the slide deck out. We hope uh, very soon, uh, which we'll have the links in it, uh, embedded in it. Um, I did want to encourage you all to sign up for office hours. Uh, I will drop that link in the chat again. Um, it's important and also some of you have uh, submitted questions, uh, which we can then answer during those office hours ses session. Uh, there also was ask a question available um, for sort of more one-off uh, questions, but if you have any uh, specific questions in your circumstances that you want to sort out with a TA provider related to undisbursed funds, please do sign up for office hours. And again, they'll have two sessions, the 17th and the 18th. I'm four, I'm sorry. 17th, 18th, 9th and 10th, uh, where you can book those uh, appointments. Uh, did want to note that right now the page is only showing the next set of dates in June, uh, but you can also register for those July sessions. Um, and we do have some flexibility, so if none of those work, um, let us know. Um, let's see, and with that, uh, wrapping up in the last few minutes here, I want to thank everyone for presenting um, and thank those of you who have put these slides together and um, offer. Um, John, did you did you uh, want to uh, try, try to maybe answer a couple of these questions that we've gotten through the chat I, I before um, giving it to a uh, ping? Uh huh. Yeah, let me just. Uh, I've noticed a couple things. So, so yeah. one is um, just quickly um, confirmation on the last day to disperse the funds. So, again, what what we had said earlier was the very last day you should the very last day you should send your draw and that is, you know, basically uh, making sure you're approved to draw down is September 27th, but we'd recommend doing it a few days earlier um, just to, to make sure nothing happens. And then there were some, a, a question on, uh, you know, when will we be chosen for, um, one-on-one -on -one appointments and everybody who submits will, will get an appointment or in the process of sending some out now. Uh, and as Rob said, we do have some flexibility on the time, so if um, the times that we allocated don't work for you, uh, you'll get an email and you'll be able to let us know uh, of other options. And then also in the sign up sheet, uh, there is an opportunity to provide those details. Great, thanks. Okay, and I can answer a couple more. Um, so someone had asked about uh, what do you do about the revised, if you have a revised CO voucher and those, any vouchers that say revised, you don't have to worry about it at all. They've already been taken care of and it does not reflect any money that's available. So those can, you can just ignore. Um, another question was about the moving money into public service activities um, when you're swapping year funds. But uh, the good news is, is that public services does not have a an origin year test like planning and admin does it has the uh, obligation expenditure and obligation date that you see on your pr 26 financial summary but there is no second origin year test for public services so it doesn't matter about the year of the money that you're spending for your public services right thank you susan um and uh uh Peng, did you want to have the last word um, yes, I just wanted to thank uh, all the presenters uh, for putting this presentation together. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank everyone who joined uh, today's webinar. 
um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Thank you. All right, thank you, Poping, and that concludes today's webinar.